Hey friends, before we get into the show today, I want to take a moment to say how excited and grateful I am that my new book, The Seven Disciplines of Uncommon Freedom, is published and available for you. You can find it right now on Amazon.com or the audio version on Audible.com. The response to the book so far has been amazing, and I want to thank everyone for their support. Our guest on today's show, John C. Maxwell, is one of the many reasons I wanted to write this book in the first place. His books and his talent as an author and leader have influenced and inspired me so much over the years. John C. Maxwell is a number one New York Times bestselling author, speaker, coach, and leader who has sold more than 34 million books. He is the founder of Maxwell Leadership, a leadership development organization that has trained tens of millions of leaders in every nation. Having been recognized as the number one leader in business and as the world's most influential leadership expert, Maxwell continues to influence individuals and organizations worldwide, from Fortune 500 CEOs and national leaders to entrepreneurs and the leaders of tomorrow. For more information, visit maxwellleadership.com. Beck and I have been very fortunate to get to know John personally, and we are so privileged that he has taken time out of his schedule to be on today's show with us. This is an exceptional episode you do not want to miss. Let's dive in. All right, friends. Well, today we are super honored and excited to have a very special guest with us on the show. We are joined by our friend, John C. Maxwell. And I know that if he was talking to you, he would say that he's your friend as well. Uh, John has published 89 books, which is just an absolutely mind blowing statistic and sold more than 39 million copies worldwide. A couple of interesting facts about John's writing process is that he handwrites all of his initial drafts and that he begins working on his next book the day he submits a final manuscript. That's incredible. So John has been a virtual mentor to me and Kevin for about 12 years. And we were first introduced to his book, The Five Levels of Leadership, and it really rocked our worlds. And since then, we have devoured so many of his resources. And in fact, as a couple, we used the Leadership Promises for Everyday Devotional to get us through a really challenging season. So thank you, John, for that. We really appreciate it. John, your writings have been a huge influence on our lives. The positive impact that your books have had on us is one of the reasons I was inspired to write my first book, which is called The Seven Disciplines of Uncommon Freedom. People have already said, oh, that sounds like a John Maxwell title. Ah, <laughs> boy. It's a good but, title. Um, and then you recently released another book called The 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication. I just finished listening to it recently, and it is a phenomenal book, super practical, and just an awesome book that we're really excited to discuss with you today. John, welcome to the show. It's a huge honor. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Kevin, Becca. It's good to see both of you. You're wonderful friends, and I look forward to our next time together, but let's do a podcast today. What do you say? Let's do it. Sounds good. So, John, the first question I have is that the first law of communication in your book is the law of credibility. It was one of my favorite chapters, and the subtitle was really important to me. The most effective message is the one that you live. Can you expound on that for us, please? I'll be glad to, Kevin. It's possible to speak on a subject that you don't live. When I grew up in the educational field, I saw that happen all the time. So somebody picks a subject and they go out and they speak on it, but it's not really who they are. And I call that giving out information. In other words, I'm speaking on something that really doesn't affect me. It's not really who I am, but it's a good lesson. So I give it to you. And basically you receive it in about the same attitude that I give it. It's kind of like, well, that's nice, but there's no moral authority to it. There's no personableness in it. There is no conviction or burden or punch to it. And it's because I'm giving information to you, but it has to go through me for it to have credibility. And so whenever I do a lesson, the first thing I do is I teach the lesson to me. And I ask myself, do I live this? Is this who I am? Is this what I do? Is this what I believe? And I don't think you have to be perfect in that subject. There are a lot of times I'll say, now, this is what I'm trying to become. I'm not there yet, but I'm working. What I'm going to give you today, I'm working on right now myself. What I'm going to share with you that will help you, I'm using right now to help me. And so sometimes as a communicator, I come across Kevin as a person on a kind of like on a journey with you. It's like, I'm okay, maybe I'm your teacher, but maybe I'm sitting beside you 
and we're learning together and we're growing together. But here's what I know. If the subject doesn't affect me, when I teach it, it won't affect you either. Mm. And we teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are and who we are. And so that's the law of credibility. And so when somebody says, I'm going to speak on the subject, what do you think? The first question I ask is, well, do you live it? When I was young, in my communication years, probably I was maybe 24, 25, very young, but I'd been communicating for maybe two or three solid years. I made this decision. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. I said, I am not going to teach a lesson that I do not live or that I do not believe. I'm just not going to teach it. I'm not going to teach it. And therefore, there are a lot of lessons I don't teach because I don't either live it or I don't believe it. But the moment that I made that decision, I think, is the moment that I became very credibility. Let's put it this way. Authenticity alone doesn't make you successful, but if you lack it, I'll guarantee failure. And so it's kind of like the lesson has to live out and be who I am for it to be effective. Does that make sense? That makes a ton of sense. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh my goodness, John. And I think that meeting you in person, do you know how sometimes you meet someone that you really admire and then you think, hmm, well... They weren't exactly what I expected them to be. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And I'm sure you've had that encounter. Well, for us, uh, meeting you was beyond what we would have expected. And it was mostly because of your authenticity. And you just had this way of taking down walls where, you know, the person on the receiving end of communication with you feels like you're in the trenches with them. And that's yeah. such a different experience because the yeah. trust is so immediately transferred that we're able to receive your messages so much more easily. So. Well, thank you. You know, when I met the two of it's kind of like we were having a, a dinner together, but it was kind of like by then dinner, I felt like I knew you all my life. It was just like, you're just beautiful people. And I think one of the things that make the two of you so very special to me is that you have that authenticity. You have that realness in your life and it just shows up. Here's what I know. Let me just say this. When you don't know me, when I speak, you'll take my words at face value. But when you know me, Everything I say now is put through the grid of does this person live that life? And so if you are authentic and credible, the longer people know you, the more powerful your words become because they're not only words from your lips, but they're backed up by your life. Just as if what you say and what you do doesn't resonate or doesn't connect, then my words began to lose effectiveness, influence, and power with you. Because you say, hey, he's just talking right now. Hey, hey, he's just preaching right now. And you know what? So being credible as a communicator will make your words even have more moral authority and weight after people get to know you, if that makes sense to you. Makes a ton of sense. Completely. And then I think people will advocate for you as a speaker as well, because I know for us having the experience with you in the small dinner setting was revolutionary. And then every conversation we had after that was like, he is exactly what we we're hoping he would be, you know? And so that really transferred to how we were able to share how much we admire you, but your work and the time and effort you put in because you're so relatable. So that was really neat. Okay, our next question is in the law of collaboration, you mentioned that success is determined by the people you collaborate with to help you complete a task. What should we be looking for in people we collaborate with to make us better communicators? Well, first of all, of all the 16 laws in my book, I tell people this law will get you further down the road faster than any other laws. When I was young, I didn't understand the law of collaboration at all. And so I didn't. In fact, it never entered my mind that I could sit down with something I was going to speak on and have a few friends give me some of, the, of their ideas and thoughts. And so I did it all by myself, which is a weakness, because now I'm teaching everything from a very personal, but very small, minute, narrow perspective. So when people say, I want to really improve as a communicator, the first thing I tell them is this law right here, the law of collaboration. What you got to do is you got to get some people around you that will help you. And honestly, I'm a feedback fanatic. And the reason for that is, is because if I'm getting ready to teach a subject and I sit down with the two of you and I throw out the subject, I will promise you, promise you, promise you that you'll make it better. It's not sometime, it's every time. And the reason why is because you have a total different perspective that I do on the same subject. And you'll give me fresh eyes you'll open up things that I'm blindsided to. And all of a sudden I'll say, oh my gosh, yeah, that's true. I never thought of that. So I tell people all the time, because I like to talk about thinking. In fact, one of my favorite books I wrote several years ago now called How Successful People Think. 
Yep. And there are two kinds of thinking that are just huge. And one of them is shared thinking, which is what we're talking about right here. That's collaboration. And the other is sustained thinking, which means I stay with the thought a little bit longer so I can go deeper with the thought. And I tell people, if they'll do those two things, their whole life will begin to improve. So when I go into a room with an idea, I assume that when I walk out of that room, it'll be a better idea. Why? Because I'm sitting at the table with people like you and saying, here's a thought that I have, or here's a lesson I'm going to teach. Talk to me about it. Improve it. What would you change? Oh, what did it, hey, what do I not have in it? And you'll make it better. And I walk out of the room much better than I walked into the room. In fact, if you walk into the room and then walk out of the room and you're not better, you don't have the right people in the room, to be honest with you. You better change the people in the room. So this collaboration and shared thinking is just huge. And in the book, I talked about the kind of people you want to have in the room because I wanted to write the book so that when people want to collaborate, they get the right people. For example, I think that you ought to have in that room people that are already good communicators themselves because they understand the art of communication. I think you want to have people in the room that are creative, that can take an idea and improve it and make it better. I think you want to have people in the room that really know you as a person because a lot of times the illustrations or the thoughts they'll draw out come out of life experiences with you. So these are things that you just want to make sure that you have in the room when you collaborate. And if you do, it'll just get better. It'll just get better. So for people that have just started speaking, the best thing you can do is invite a few people into a collaboration team. And by the way, talk to them before you speak and talk to them after you speak. Wow. I've been writing for a lot of years. And about 30 years ago, I picked a person that was an English major. His name is Charlie Wetzel. He's been with me for over 30 years now. He helps me write books. And I was pastor in that time, and he was in my congregation. And so I would say, Charlie, I said, when I speak, I want you to pick out the two best minutes of a talk and the two worst minutes. Mm. Wow. And I want you to tell me why they were the two best, and I want you to tell me why they were the two worst. And what I was trying to do is I was teaching him how to read an audience. I was teaching him how to read a teaching. And the reason I did that is because I thought, if I can teach him how to do these things, when he writes for me, he'll write from my perspective. I would give him a quote book, maybe a hundred quotes in it. I say, Charlie, you check off the best quotes. It could be five, maybe it's 20, I don't know, but you think are the best quotes in the book. You check them off and then let's go over the book. And so we do that and I look at it and he'd have his little check marks there. Charlie, let me tell you a reason why I would never use that quote. And I would teach him, I'd say, so when you're researching for me, that's something that I won't really talk about. For example, I never use quotes that make me look smarter than my audience. I'm very careful with that. You know, I don't walk out in front of my audience and say, how many miles is the moon from the earth? Now, <sighs> really, do we care? I don't know myself, but here's what I'm saying. I'm asking that question to make people think I'm smart. So the first book, we had almost all misses. What he thought was good and what I thought was good was not the same. And so I said, now let me teach you why I would pick these quotes. By the third book, about 90% of the time, we're picking the same quotes. And again, what, so in collaborating, it's that kind of conversation. I sharpened him, he sharpens me. We make each other better. I think the one thing you have to be in having a collaborating team is you have to be secure because you don't want them to tell you what they think you want to hear. You want them to tell you probably what you don't want to hear. And right. as a leader, if I'm not careful, I can shut people down or turn them off or you know keep them at a distance. And, and, and that doesn't help me. It doesn't help them. So I think you have to be secure and always have people that love you. I mean, don't bring the people who don't care for you into the room. So they're just the little things like that. I talk, I give a whole list in that chapter of people that you want to have on your collaborating team. But anyway, those are a few thoughts. So John, good communicators learn from great communicators. That's the law of observation. Yeah. Who are you learning from these days? Well, I'm learning from everybody. And let me just say this, everybody is my teacher. And so whenever I hear someone communicate or talk, I listen very carefully to them and I ask myself, what is it that is, works best for them? And I promise you, when I hear anybody talk, I can walk up to them right now and say, let me tell you where your real sweet spot is in communication. You want to stay here longer and you want to develop it and make it even better. So when people ask me, who are you learning from? You know, I'm learning from everybody. I promise you again, if we were having lunch together, I would ask you a few questions and I'd say, Becca, that's so good. That helps me a lot. My gosh, Kevin, thanks. You helped me. So I think there's a posture 
of humility that makes us teachable, that is so important in observation. So I grew up watching people communicate. And of course, in the book, I talk about some of those people that taught me how to communicate then. I just did a podcast earlier today with Andy Stanley, and I mentored Andy. He's a close friend of mine. I mentored Andy for 30 years. So we were talking about the book that, in fact, this is the book they're talking about right here, The 16 Laws of Communication. So we were talking about the book. And so much of the time, I would say, I learned that from you, Andy. You taught me that. You taught me to take one thing and rework it throughout the whole lesson and not talk about 25 different things and to stay focused and stay centered. So I'm constantly open and learning and listening to communicators. What's good about them? Hey, what works and what doesn't work? And you'll know that you're going to become a good student of communication when you can listen to somebody and say, this is what makes them good or this is what hurts them right now. They need to make a change here. And so you study, it's almost like sometimes, I used to turn the TV off when somebody was communicating and just watch them for five minutes and ask myself, what is it that's attractive that draws me in when I can't hear them? What mannerism do they have that I like? Oh my gosh, what do they just do as far as some kind of a movement that they had that I said, oh, that's very attractive, that'll help. So I'm constantly, constantly learning every day, every day, whoever I'm with, I'm going to learn from them. They're going to teach me something. One of the things that I appreciated about that chapter in your book was, and it's something I have to go back and dig deeper into, was teaching us that we have to figure out what our natural strengths are uh, in our natural styles. It's like you talked about humor and that very few people can utilize humor effectively, but a lot of people try and they end up falling flat on their face. So you really have to become a student of yourself. Also ask for feedback. Like I wish you would have been there um, at the presentation I gave back in March because I would love to have your feedback on that. But you know, being willing to have that feedback, but also being a student of yourself to figure out, okay, what am I good at? What do I need to focus on? So it was very helpful for me to realize I need to go back, study that chapter, and develop a better game plan for myself for what my strengths are when it comes to communication. Yeah, that's such a good point. I'm glad you brought it up, Kevin. And let me just say this. Uh, I do a lot of speaking international. I think I've, I don't really know, but I think I've spoken in over 100 countries of the world. I've spoken in probably half the countries of the world. Of course, that's no big deal. If you're old, you get to do that. If you're not old, you can't do that. But the point being... When I spoke to international audiences in the beginning, it was very difficult because humor doesn't translate. There's a whole bunch of things that don't really work with an international culture, all the innuendos, all that stuff. It does. And so for the first few years, I didn't like it. I didn't like speaking internationally because it was a different world. So this is all about communicating, connecting. But I learned quickly that maybe I was getting ready to tell a story and I would look at the audience and I'd say, now you're going to have to help me here. Maybe I'm going to tell a story about giving an allowance to my children for doing chores. And I'll, I'll ask him, do you do that here in this country? Do you give an allowance for doing chores? And sometimes they'll nod and say, yeah, we do that. I say, oh, okay, then this story's going to work here. Thank you for helping me. And maybe I'd ask him a couple more questions about the chores and the allowance. And sometimes they'd look at me and nobody's home. They don't give up. And I'd say, okay, well, I'm not going to use that. Now, oh my gosh, it made me become an international connector with people. And here's what I discovered a long time ago. When you're not sure and you're speaking, just stop and ask the people. Say, you know, does this relate to you? Is this something that is your world? If it is, let's go forward. If it isn't, we'll go another route. And it just taught me so much. And what happens is the moment you ask people to help you, they are on your side. I mean, they're in there pitching for you and, and they're giving you a thought or night and say, oh man, I love that. Okay, I'm going to talk about that. And off you go and you know, they're saying, what a great speech. Well, they, I just took their idea. So all of that is part of learning how to communicate and connect with people. That's good. I'm a former school teacher. And part of the reason I went into teaching was both because I wanted to make an impact, but also because of being in environments where I didn't enjoy the way the communication happened. And I thought to myself, why are you in this career field? Because you have such power to... Yeah create change if you can create impact and drive someone to action. But then so many people just stand up there and just talk and uh -huh. it becomes just disappointing, I think, to the of person course. who's in the seat listening because there's just no engagement. So hearing how you've been just such a student of that your entire life is fascinating and it's no wonder you're so good at what you do. 
one of our questions is for those listening that don't necessarily communicate from stage, how do these laws of communication help them? I'm so glad you asked that question, Becca, because I think when the people pick up the book, they're going to naturally say, I think this is for a speaker. And it's not. Somebody asked me the other day now said, who can benefit from your book on communication? I said, if you talk, you can benefit. <laughs> now, if you don't talk to people, then you don't really want the book, okay? But I mean, think about a parent. What do you as a parent do? You're trying to influence your children. You're trying to connect with your children. You're trying to put the right values into their life. I mean, you're communicating constantly to your children. Every one of these laws can be applied on a one-to-one -one level, one-to-small group level, or one-to-a-large audience level. So when we wrote it, what makes the laws work? You know, this is my fourth laws book. I wrote the laws of leadership, the laws of teamwork, the laws of personal growth, and now the laws of communication. And I can still remember when I wrote the laws of leadership, which was my first laws book. I had a guy come up to me and he said, John, he said, I disagree with one of your laws. I was signing books and he said, I disagree with one of your laws. And, and I said, that's okay. And I signed the book and handed it back to him and he just stood there. And all of a sudden I realized it wasn't okay with him, that it was okay with me that he disagreed with one of the laws. And I told him, I write the book to help you, not to make you happy. I'm a leader, not a clown. But, I, but then I, I told him, I said, look, it's kind of like a person say, I disagree with the law of gravity. Okay. But if you go up to a five-story building and jump off, you immediately buy into the law. I mean, the laws don't ask you if you like them or if you agree with them. It's just, they're the laws. So the laws of communication cross over. They cross over culture, they cross over to the size of the group of people that you're speaking, they cross over as far as time. That's what makes them a law. When I write these law books, I spend a lot of time really reducing them down to what are the essential laws of leadership, but it relates to any person. If you are communicating, if you're wanting it all to influence people by your words, then it's a priceless book. Excellent. Agreed. Uh, so, John, what's next for you? Uh, can you share anything about what you're currently working on since we know that you start your next manuscript the second you, uh, or the day after you submit your final? Well, this one is really unusual, okay? This is on your podcast only. Yeah, as soon as I wrote this book, I wrote another book called How to Receive a Return on Failure, okay? And I wrote that book. In fact, when I was with you, if I remember right, I taught that lesson to your group, How to Receive a Return. Okay, so the manuscript's done. And we have our own publishing company now. So I put it in the queue and I said, this would follow the 16 laws of leadership or of communication. And then about six weeks ago, I just felt very clearly that I needed to write a book as quickly as I could, because I feel it's pressing on, on our culture. So I'm writing a book right now that'll come out next March. And How to Receive Return on Failure has been put on the shelf for a moment. It, it'll come out. But it won't be the next book out. The next book that's going to come out is a book I'm entitled, I'm calling it High Road Leadership with the subtitle, Bringing People Together in a World that Divide. Wow. Leadership sad. I'm very heavy when I see our country and I see what's happening. And I'm seeing leaders divide people instead of bring them together and do it for personal interest instead of people's interest. Anyway, so I'm writing that book right now and got my writing team on it. We're, in fact, this is a major collaboration book because I have to write it fairly quickly. I brought six my six key writing team people, and we've spent uh, four days now just working the book, working the book, talking back, throwing back ideas, and we're going to spend a couple more days. So this is a major collaboration book. So that'll be the next one. But yeah, I wrote, I'm doing podcasts. In, I'm in the studio all day doing podcasts, but I got up early this morning and I wrote for about two hours before I came here. But I'm always writing. And I have about, oh, eight or nine books that I still want to write. And then, I mean, they're on the kind of in the line, you know? So I'm a person of faith. So I was talking to God the other day. I said, God, you, I've got some more books I got. Or you got to let me live so longer. You know, I, I, as if God's going to say, oh, I never thought about that, John, of course. Right, right. But anyway, yeah, I write every day. That's who I am. And that's what I do. Yeah. That's yep. part of the power of five for you. Yes. You better believe it. John, that's kind of a cool transition because we wanted to focus on the 16 laws of communication. But I did a post on Facebook about a week ago and I said, hey, I have the, you know, the special opportunity to interview John Maxwell. What one question would you ask him if you had the opportunity to interview him yourself? So I got quite a few responses and there were some interesting themes. But 
there's two questions I'd love to ask you in the last few minutes we have. And the first one really lines up well with what you just talked about. How have you had to adjust your leadership techniques to meet the challenges of our changing society over the last three to four years? We've gone through major changes. In my 50 plus years of leading and teaching leadership and writing on leadership, I would say that we are in now the most challenging time that I can remember. Several things have happened. Social media now become the dominant impression upon culture. Uh, COVID took everybody out of their comfort zone and caused us all to live a life that was uncomfortable and different. And for example, in leadership before COVID, you could, as a leader, lay out, this is kind of the vision. Five years ago, the leader controlled the conversation and pretty much controlled the agenda. That's not true now. Today, leaders have to be able to uh, pivot quickly. One of the big differences is people now through social media, they almost declare what the agenda is going to be for the leader instead of the leader declaring the agenda for the people. Some of that's good. Some of that's not good at all. So you have to be a better listening leader now. You have to have much more flexibility. You have to be able to adjust extremely quick. In fact, I wrote a book called Leader Shift before all this happened. And that book has gone crazy, but I know why it's gone crazy because I wrote it before COVID and I didn't know, but all of a sudden people are, you know, the word pivot, 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 we heard so many times. Leaders have to be much more willing to hold their agenda and serve the people's immediate need first so that they can then get to their agenda. Because when a person has a need, a felt need, they're not listening to where you want to go until that felt need is addressed. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like I tell leaders now, uh, find your people, help them where they are, and see and ask yourself how long it's going to take them to be able to take a journey with you. And for some, they can do it quicker than others, but the, the leader's pace is slower right now. It's much more slower. People don't accept the leadership as easily as they did. And we've confused voice on social networking with leadership itself. Right. And you see, you never know what kind of a leader you are until you ask for commitment from people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big joke. I watch people, you know, well, I have X amount of followers. All that means is people are, you know, Instagram, whatever it is, they're just looking at you. And, and by the way, they move from you in about 3.2 seconds right. to something else. So they confuse, I got X amount of followers with I'm leading those people. You're not leading those people at all. And so there's a big difference. You, you'll know that when you're leading people and you're a good leader, because when you ask for commitment, they buy into it. There's very little commitment through social media. So those are changes. Yeah. Hopefully I answered the question pretty good for you. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. And then I just think about when you talk about, you know, finding the felt needs of the people you're working with, it's a noisy world right now. So like, I'm not sure the people even always know what their felt needs are. And it seems like they're changing so quick. It's almost like people are so needy right now. They're not as strong as they used to be. They're not as resilient as they used to be. And so leading them is definitely more difficult because like you said, find the ones that will commit to something and follow through. And it so seems true, more Becky. scarce than it used to be. Would you agree? 100% I would agree. I love the phrase. I don't want to steal it from you and use it. It's a noisy world. Mm -hmm. It's really noisy. And everybody's clamoring for attention and a little bit of space somewhere. And you're exactly right. It's not a thinking world. It's not a reflective world. And the insecurities and dysfunction of people have them looking from, for thumbs up from people they don't even know. And it's kind of either making their day or breaking their day. And I, you don't even know these people. Here's what we have discovered in transformation of countries that because we teach values. The more good values I have within me, the less validation I need from the outside. Mm. But if I don't have good values within me, oh my gosh. I am a sucker for validation. And so I think what happens is we have a culture that lacks good, solid, proven values. Amen to that. So we're drifting. We're drifting and just looking for anything that gives us any kind of hope. No one has ever drifted to a desired location, okay? That is so true. Yeah, you just don't do it. Can I add another question, Kevin? I don't want uh, to take it. Okay, 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 so then um, maybe you've covered this a little bit, but if you had anything else you wanted to share, your best advice for leading through adversity because it definitely feels like that's kind of where a lot of us are living right now, where we've been at a place where we've been on more of a high and now it's a more challenging season to lead through. So what advice would you give for that? Well, Becca, I have a teaching called the leadership dance. 
Hmm. And I call it the leadership dance because there's movement to it. And basically the teaching is this. There are times when you need to be in front of the people. They need to see the example. Truly the words follow me are the words they need to hear. During adversity, you need to be with the people. Hmm. You need to be walking in the crowd so you can hear what they're saying and you can listen to them and you're close and you can touch them, if that makes sense, okay? Yes. In adversity, you also better dance up high. You better go above the people. you got to see a bigger picture than they do because when crisis happens, the picture narrows. You watch people during adversity and crisis, and what was this big gets like this. They become, they, they, they're, this is all they can see right here. Oh, yeah. and, and so you got to be above them. Somebody's got to be looking for the big picture. And then you also need to sometimes, you need to walk behind them. In other words, you've led them. You need to see them walk without you to see if they're applying all the leadership teaching you're doing. You see what I'm saying? So when, when people talk about leadership and it's just top down, it's a dance. And it, during adversity and difficult times, you better be dancing which means there are some people you need to be in front of, there are some people you need to be side of, there are some people you need to be above, and there are some people you need to be behind. It's not the same, in your group, in your, you've got a huge group, in your group, they're requiring different dancing from you, and, and you have to be able to do all of those things for them. Multi-dimensional leadership, wow, that's-, that's Yeah, really totally, cool. Becca, yeah, yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, John, last question is, coming up on college football season. <laughs> And we share a passion for the same team. Are they having you come to speak? Well, you know, they ask me every year to come and speak. I didn't go last year, but I go a lot of years. For I did. He's talking about Ohio State. I did. Yeah, we know. You know. Oh. <laughs> All right. You know. Oh. Right. Yeah. You know. Uh, cause I we grew up in Ohio. So I keep close touch, especially with our athletic director. And so we'll see what the season unfolds. I kind of look at my schedule and see if I can maybe get up to, I have an invitation to go to Notre Dame when they play at, uh, when Ohio State plays at Notre Dame. I may run up there and, and go to that game, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But yeah, I'm a big Buckeye fan and maybe this will be the year, you know. We hope so. That's yeah. what we say every year as <laughs> Cleveland fans as well. So, hey, yeah. John. It was an absolute treat, a privilege, yes. and an honor. If you asked me a year and a half ago when I started my podcast, Kevin, make a list of people you'd like to have on that you don't think is possible. You would have been at the top of that list. And we're just so grateful for the mentorship that you've given us through your books and then yes. now personally over the last few months. Mm -hmm. And we pray for you. We're so grateful for you. And I am looking forward to the pheasant hunt in September with you. So, Oh, I'm so glad you're going with me. Yep. Oh, this is going to be, be so we will have so much. First of all, thanks for having me on your podcast. You're beautiful people, beautiful people. But I want the people that listen to you, watch you, follow you. Here's what I want the people to know. You're the real deal. You're just beautiful people who care enough to lead well. If you don't care enough to lead well, I tell people all the time, if you, when you stop loving your people, stop leading them because you'll start misusing them. And mm -hmm. back at you and Kevin care, you really care. And I love that about you. I love the fact that you put your people first and you want your people to have the very best and you withhold nothing from them. You're always ready to resource them, teach them, do everything you can to improve their life. And so you're beautiful friends and I'm very excited about your leadership and what you're doing. And uh, I'm your friend. So if you need anything, you know where I am. Okay. We do. Thank Thanks you, so John. much, John. It's been such a blessing. Hey, blessings. Have a good All rest right. of your day. Great, John. Thank you so much. We yes. know you've got a tight time schedule. Get you out of here three minutes early, but thank you so much. Are you both pleased? Yeah, we do, okay. Well, thank you, Super John. grateful, and uh, I'll see you in a month and a half. All right. We'll have some fun. Bye-bye. Blessings. Bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Hey, friends. Thanks for listening to the Uncommon Freedom Show. First, I want to extend another massive thank you to our friend John Maxwell for being on our show today. What an amazing conversation it was. And as promised, as an exclusive offer to our podcast audience, John's team is offering a limited time discount code on the book plus free shipping. Go to www.16lawsofcommunication.com and use promo code Kevin at checkout. That's promo code K-E-V-I-N. You'll get the cheapest available price as well as free shipping. So it's just as good as Amazon. Second, I want to thank everyone who has checked out my new book, The Seven Disciplines of Uncommon Freedom. I am beyond grateful for the support, encouragement, and positive feedback I have received so far. 
If you want to get a copy for yourself or a friend, just head to Amazon.com and search The Seven Disciplines of Uncommon Freedom. It's available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions. Third, if you have enjoyed the book, would you please leave a great review on Amazon, five star preferred? Reviews are so important to continuing to get the book out there and into more people's hands. Thank you so much for your support.